Well, thank you. Um, this was a terrific panel. Thank you for staying on time. You know, one of the worst uh, uh, responsibilities of a moderator is to beat on you guys, and you did a terrific job, so thank you. Questions? Hi, uh, Adam Saigon from Denver. I have a question for uh, Linda. Um, so I, I work with, uh, we have several uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants in our, in our weight management department. They actually approach me about taking the ABOM exam, which of course is only for physicians. And so, and I, I, I think I told them about this, and, but they hadn't heard about it. So I guess I'm wondering, are the national NP and PA societies promoting this exam to their members, and, and how, many of, how many of those people have <coughs> taken it? I, I don't have the statistics on how many actually took it. I'll have that in a couple of days. Um, it, remember, this is a new exam, so marketing definitely is one of the, the challenges. Uh, those societies were involved in the uh, practice analysis and were subject matter experts in the item development. Um, we, being CDR, work to market to all of those groups. Some res better response than others from, from some of the other disciplines there. Uh, but definitely the challenge is getting that word out. Thank you. Eric Peterson from AAPA. And we did participate in the <clears throat> in several stages, officially in the uh, task analysis. And a number of our members also were item developers. From our perspective, our major uh, objection to the test is that it does not uh, include the medical management piece and therefore does not reflect the scope of practice of a PA. The exam test on core competencies for obesity and weight management, it is not an advanced practice exam. Um, so I'm going to compare it to a CDE, a certified diabetes educator. Uh, where you would have core competencies looking across diabetes management, but not have the depth. So with this exam, um, I, I'm a dietitian. I would know about the medications, to use your example. I would be expected to know of side effects or what may or may not be appropriate, but I wouldn't go into depth into the prescribing of it. Likewise, a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, I would not expect to be able to know the medical nutrition therapy aspects, but would know more of the core levels in terms of dietary management there. Another question? I, I would just say it has been suggested that as time goes on, um, a, a couple options. One, that there might be additional um, panel, exam panels developed for nurse practitioners, dietitians, whatever, or that, um, I don't know whether ABOM would ever include nurse practitioners or physician assistants because of the prescribing function, or, or the own, their own groups for nurse practitioners to develop their own exam. Elaine Trujillo, NCI. Um, Linda, I have a question about um, uh, CMS and the fact that the dietitians are not reimbursed for obesity. Uh, how we sort of missed the ball on that. And I'm wondering if this new certification, uh, if there's any um, possibility or future hopes that there will be coverage. I hope there's hope. I, I, <laughs> that's a, I am wondering if one of the future speakers on policy will address the yeah. treatment. I, I, I think the that's act. part of a because later Because that re really gets at more of your question on, on CMS and coverage. Thank you. So I have a question for the two of you. Um, you know, you're, the, the obesity curriculum in a medical school is competing with a lot of other, a lot of others. The same is true of questions on the licensure exam. So um, how will you navigate, uh, and um, how do you propose to insert this as, as a problem in, in what are already crowded fields? start by addressing that. I, I know that that's always an issue at the undergraduate level, at the medical school level. But as, as someone, I was on the curriculum committee at the University of Pittsburgh for many years, and someone pointed out to me, we, we don't teach things from the 1950s in our current curriculum. We've taken things out. So as things become more important from a public health standpoint, they will start to, to enter into the curriculum as well. 
Also, and Bob might remember this, there was a consortium of schools that was in, in, more interested in teaching nutrition um, like the NAA, yeah, the NAA right, right. Uh, for, for some time, and it was, I think it was uh, nine or 11 schools. It wasn't a whole lot of, of, of schools, and that, that sort of initiative, I think, is going to spread significantly. The University of Chicago um, has made some significant strides in terms of undergraduate education as well, so I think just having someone there who can come to the forefront and say this is an important aspect of medical training is what's essential. Yeah, it should happen. Um, well, regarding the licensure uh, examination, which I mentioned, uh, the only way we're going to make a change there is to actually have content experts on the committees mm -hmm. who are doing the legwork of writing items, and, and I'm, I'm probably among others. I happen to be on the, on the uh, item uh, writing committee right now, in which I hopefully will start de developing items for the pool. They're, they're not opposed to it. They just don't have experts in the area because there's so few of us. So that's how you address the, the exam. And that has a downstream effect because if students know that's going to be tested, they're more interested. That's why we started there. Regarding medical curriculum, and I'm involved very much at, at Northwestern University on medical curriculum, uh, it is a crowded field. But, I th but you have to go at it in multiple ways. One is you need a local champion. Uh, it's actually essential to have a lo local champion in the medical school or nursing school or whatever the trainee is at who, who is advocating for it, will step up and do the instruction and integrate obesity into the different modules. So for example, um, we have, most of our obesity is in the endocrine module, but I am ensuring, and me and my colleagues, that obesity is also part of the cardiovascular module, it's part of the pulmonary module and everything else. So, it starts with an individual who's on the in the education world at a university and advocating for it and stepping forward. It's like a lot of things in life, right? You got to walk the walk and actually push it forward. Well, given given the um, the shortage of, of champions, um, you know, I think, uh, and we were talking about this at lunch, that that there's probably a disproportionate distribution of expertise in obesity and where the need is greatest. Um, how do we how do we adjust, how do we address that? I mean, the medical schools, Northwestern, Case, uh, Pittsburgh uh, schools here um, all have that kind of expertise. But I worry more about um, the the hinterlands, as they say. It's a, it's a great question, Bill. So I mean, not this isn't a plug for the program, but there's a, pro a program called Project Echo, which started in New Mexico, and the goal of Project Echo is to uptrain primary care physicians to manage complex medical problems. Um, the prototype was hepatitis C management, uh, and what had been shown was that not just primary care physicians, but advanced care practitioners, nurse practitioners, for example, could take uh, care of patients with hepatitis C as well as the specialists at Albuquerque, and that was the impetus to expand uh, uh, the program to other areas. So I direct Project ECHO for Childhood Obesity, which is based at the University of Chicago and reaches, you know, reaches far and wide. Uh, thereafter. So that, I think, is probably the best approach. I was just having lunch with Adam Tsai, and we both agree, I think, that training primary care physicians and other providers to provide the care is probably the way to go to, to tackle this problem, rather than keeping everything within kind of the ivory tower, which is what's been taking place so far. And there are, there are mechanisms to do that. I just want to add a thing. The, uh, parallel to the work that you're doing, and I've mentioned this to you before, Bill, is we have an inter-society collaborative called the Obesity Medical Education Collaborative in which we have now developed 32 competencies working off the ACGM, ACGME six domains that is done in residency and so on. And we are now writing benchmarks, which is, which is your anchors of standardization to go through each competency. So we are trying, well, we're trying, and then, and then after that, EPAs or trustable professional activities. So what we're trying to do is to make this camera ready for the schools so that if they want inpatient care or knowledge or system-based care, they will have competencies with benchmarks already developed that they could use within their curriculum um, to, to identify their, patient, their, their, their trainee's level of competence. We can't train, we can't, we can't put an instructor in there but we're trying to get, this is what your students should know. The next thing would be to develop objectives and so forth, that's, that's the framework of education. Uh, the other is the American Board of BC Medicine. F frankly, most of them are clinicians, they're not affiliated with medical schools, but some are. And if they could identify themselves as a specialist in obesity and have an academic affiliation, that hopefully gives them some leverage 
uh, to work with the Education Committee. Well, please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you. Thank you.